All right, so we're gonna get started here today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and good afternoon. I'm Alex Talk. I'm the director of the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership. Uh, uh, I want to thank our speakers today and uh, everyone else who made this event possible, especially Ruth and Lily at the Thompson Center and the staff here at the Concourse Hotel. Uh, I think we have a really terrific event lined up, and I really appreciate everybody who's made this possible. Um, let me briefly explain what the Thompson Center is for those who may not already be familiar. The Thompson Center was founded to follow in the footsteps of Governor Tommy Thompson, who proudly worked with colleagues on both sides of the political aisle to advance the public good. In seeking to carry on Governor Thompson's legacy, the Thompson Center works to foster effective public leadership by offering public events such as this, funding research and scholarships, and conducting other activities across the UW system. Before we get into our topic, I um, have a little bit of housekeeping to, to mention here. Uh, so there are Q&A cards at your table uh, when we get to the Q&A session. You're welcome to ask questions directly by raising your hand or by using the Q&A cards. Uh, we also have copies of policies referenced by speakers uh, that can be found at the registration table or on our website. Uh, and most importantly, parking validation. Uh, if you parked in the Madison Concourse Hotel parking garage, you can have your parking validated at the registration table. So we're here today to talk about free speech, viewpoint diversity, and climate on campus. There's certainly free speech issues uh, in dispute on campus today. For example, when the Women's Liberation Front, which rejects the idea of a transgender identity, sought to participate in UW Law's public interest interview program, many on campus, including UW's student government, ASM, sought their exclusion, quote, because of the organization's transphobic transphobic beliefs and active engagement in harmful acts of transphobia. The law school, however, declined uh, to exclude this organization on First Amendment grounds. But today's event isn't solely about free speech and First Amendment rights. Extremely few faculty on campus today, particularly at UW-Madison, hold center of right political views. This can be a little bit hard to quantify or understand exactly how strong uh, that is, but consider that of the political contributions made by UW-Madison faculty, uh, tenured or tenure track since 2011, over 99% has gone to candidates or pact align, PACs aligned with the Democratic Party, and less than four-tenths of a percent, that's one in 250, went to candidates or PACs aligned with the Republican or Libertarian parties. This difference is even starker in some units on campus and has gotten more extreme in recent years. That's not to say there's anything wrong with donating to the Democratic Party, of course there isn't, uh, and it's not a perfect measure of the ideological distribution of faculty for lots of reasons, but I think that stark, that stark of a difference is hard to ignore, and regardless of how you look at it or the precise numbers, it's clear Again, that there are very few faculty on the political right by contemporary US standards. Observing this does not answer the question of whether this is a problem, but I think it does at least raise it as a question and raise the question of why this is the case. Of course, if you value diversity of opinion as the University of Wisconsin explicitly claims to, it is a problem almost by definition. And there are plenty of other reasons it might be concerning depending on the causes, even if it is not inherently so. But I also want to go beyond that today. We've billed today's event as a solutions-focused discussion. My experience has been that discussions of viewpoint diversity, uh, campus climate, and free speech often begin and end with a question of whether there is a problem. That's a worthwhile discussion, and I'm sure one that we will touch on today. And you can see why things end there. If we don't agree on whether it's a problem, why discuss solutions, especially if you're not convinced there's a problem. But I think it's a mistake to end the conversation there. And I hope we can also give the solution side its due today. Let me very briefly explain why. First, I expect some of you already believe there is a problem 
If so, it probably isn't hard to convince you we should talk about solutions. I won't belabor that point. Second, it's not very valuable to identify a problem if there aren't any solutions. But even if you believe there are no problems, I think it would still be a mistake to stay out of the discussion of solutions. Consider the politician's syllogism as explained in the British political co comedy, Yes Minister. Step one, we must do something. Step two, this is something. Step three, therefore, we must do this. <laughs> My point is, to many in America today, including many legislators, there is a problem. And at least in some states, something will be done. Thus, it would behoove even those who believe that the current state is not problematic to still consider how others' concerns could be addressed without violating other important principles. I think we have an amazing lineup of speakers today to delve into these questions. In the interest of time, I'll keep their introductions very brief, but you'll find a detailed biography of each on the cards at your table. Our speakers today are Alex Mori, Director of Campus Rights Advocacy at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, or FIRE. Yoel Inbar, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Toronto. George Yancey, Professor of Sociology at Baylor University. And Jenna Robinson, President of the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. Each of our speakers will give a short presentation. After that, We'll have a discussion with all of them, including Q&A from the audience, and I'm really looking forward to all of this. It's my pleasure now to turn the floor over to Alex Morey. She is not only a First Amendment attorney and journalist working at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, but also a graduate of our own University of Wisconsin Law School. Please welcome Alex Morey. Everybody. All right, this looks like the clicker, and there's a big arrow button, and it goes to my first slide. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. As Professor Talk said, I'm Alex Mori. I work at FIRE. We are a nonpartisan, nonpartisan, uh, First Amendment advocacy nonprofit. We defend uh, folks like Mary Hall Rayford, who was talking at a city council meeting and was silenced. Uh, we defend folks like um, one of the dads of the students at you've a student at Uvalde where the mass shooting happened. He was, you know, asking questions about the police force in Uvalde and got, you know, banned from campus. Uh, we stood up for him and defended his free speech rights to ask questions. Um, folks on campus, too. So this is Kimberly D.A. She was a um, neuropharmacology student at the University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center. She happens to, you know, in her free time, have like a very sex positive Instagram and an OnlyFans and the old white guys at the University of Tennessee were like, this is not acceptable for a pharmacology student. We're going to have to like kick her out of the program. We stood up for Kim and said, no, she's got the free speech right to, you know, make Cardi B's lyrics even raunchier in her free time if she wants to, and she should still be allowed to be in your program. And then we're also, um, sometimes we sue people. So at FIRE, uh, if they're violating the First Amendment and it's very clear and they don't respond to our nasty gram, sometimes we sue people. So right now we're suing uh, the California uh, Community College System, which has forced some of its, all of its professors to make certain verbal commitments to administrators' vision of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, FIRE doesn't take a position on DEI. If you want to do DEI, great, but you just can't, you know, force people to say diversity means exactly this, and I vow to uh, promote this vision of diversity in my classroom because, of course, that's viewpoint discrimination. We're going to get, um, you know, and viewpoint discrimination is, I guess, the crux of what we're going to talk about today. Now, I only have 15 minutes, and my other panelists have lots of good things to talk to talk about. If I don't get to the question you want to ask, we've got, I think, 45 minutes of Q&A, so woohoo. So just so we're all on the same 
footing here, I'm going to talk about the legal landscape that sets us up for what I think is success when it comes to solving these problems collaboratively in higher ed. We should start with the law. There's some questions about what the law should be. I'll talk about what the law is. So on public campuses, uh, administrators are government actors. Public campuses are government entities, and the First Amendment applies in full. Now, of course, there's some wrinkles when it comes to you know, you can't stand up in the middle of your professor's lecture and start shouting because academic freedom protects their right to control the classroom. But generally, administrators who are staff cannot violate the free expression rights of students and faculty. Those rights are very broad. And then on private campuses, most private campuses make First Amendment-like promises. And so we at FIRE like to hold them to those promises. If you sign up to teach at Yale or Harvard or Wellesley or do you know they all make free expression promises uh, same if you matriculate there you expect to be able to maybe hold a, a view that might offend people or join a club that maybe not everybody likes on campus or host a speaker that's unpopular and when these schools that promise free expression nonetheless censor unpopular views we take them to task then there's also schools that are private and choose not to uh, prioritize free expression and like a lot of religious schools uh, you know if you go to the Naval Academy you kind of give up your free speech rights uh, but we just want schools to be clear before students go so let's um, talk a little bit about the you know where the where the legal landscape started to really shape up for public campuses. So how do we know that the First Amendment applies in full on public campuses? Well, um, it was sort of during another, I mean, if you want to talk about like Israel-Palestine being like a big upheaval and crisis for higher ed, it was another such era uh, when it came to McCarthyism and Vietnam era court cases that came before the Supreme Court, and it's where we are getting the law that applies to our campuses today. Okay, so first case I want to talk about is this guy, Paul Sweezy. So Sweezy versus New Hampshire. This uh, faculty member would not turn, long story short, would, did not want to discuss uh, a lecture that he had given on campus, and he alleged that academic freedom protected his right, basically, not to, uh, you know, discuss what were seen as potentially communist sympathies. Um, and his case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said in this case, you know, academic freedom is an important corollary of the First Amendment. It's protected on public campuses. And if we were to, you know, if academic freedom is so important because we don't want to put a straight jacket on the intellectual leaders of our colleges and universities. And if we do, it will imperil the future of the nation. Why? Because we don't, we'll get to this in a minute, but we don't want to uh, stop the kind of learning that requires this level of ideological diversity uh, on our campuses. So there's just one. Then we get to, come on little buddy, Okay, also McCarthy era, Keishian versus um, Board of Regents, a case w in which faculty were being asked to sign loyalty oaths saying, you know, I have never been a member of the Communist Party. Again, violated the First Amendment. The First Amendment does not tolerate laws that cast a pal of orthodoxy over the classroom. This one should live in your mind right now when you're looking at what is the latest policy on a given campus that some people are saying are suppressing their free expression rights. Uh, we want a variety of viewpoints on campus. We don't want our campuses to be echo chambers where only one viewpoint is allowed because then we cannot engage in the important liberal science of testing our views against uh, others who may think differently. So when it comes to the First Amendment and what the government can control, the government cannot impose this orthodoxy on the classroom. So again, we go back to the fact that administrators at public universities are government actors. If we see these administrators trying to say certain views are not allowed on campus, we start looking like we're in Keishian territory where, okay, well, which views are allowed? Are there only some views that are allowed? We get into orthodoxy territory. Um, okay, this is, we're at the First Amendment here, so we're, you know, I took out most of the swears that I usually use for undergrads. But so this case, um, 
you can see uh, <laughs> back again, Vietnam era. This was a one of those, um, she was sort of like an older student at the University of um, Missouri who uh, wanted to put out kind of an edgy paper, and this was very edgy for the time. I think it's like, you know, the Statue of Liberty being raped, and I think somewhere in this paper there was a headline that said, motherfucker acquitted, and, you know, everyone was clutching their pearls at the University of Missouri saying we cannot have this on our campus, but the Supreme Court again, and again, think about these quotes in today's terms. The mere dissemination of ideas, no matter how offensive to good taste, on a state university campus may not be shut off in the name alone of conventions of decency. You know, swap in a few words for offensiveness, problematic, speech that's quote unquote, you know, violent or makes me upset. Um, a lot of these principles apply today and the Supreme Court again, 1973, state colleges and universities are not enclaves immune from the sweep of the First Amendment. It applies in full. And then finally here, um, Healy versus James. Again, another key case that shows that the, the First Amendment applies to college campuses. This was um, a case where Students for Democratic Society wanted to uh, wanted to basically have a club on campus, but there were concerns about their affiliations with the national organization, which at the time had been involved in some, you know, in, uh, in violence and other uh, anti-war anti protesting. Again, swap SDS out for SJP. Students for Justice in Palestine, for example, which currently on many campuses is the, you know, unwelcome, Lots of uh, SJP chapters are being shut down because of concerns about their affiliations with the national SJP organization or the state SJP organization. But, as the Supreme Court has said, the vigilant protection of constitutional freedoms is nowhere more vital than in the com community of American schools. Boy, time goes so fast. Okay. Um, and then speakers. We often see speakers these days... Uh, you know, shouted down, or lots, we just at the University of Wisconsin here, uh, controversy over large fees imposed on controversial speakers. UW just said, just kidding, yesterday we're not going to charge um, a certain group $4,000 in security fees because they're bringing a controversial speaker, but we see that a lot, basically a free speech tax. Um, and this was Justice Marshall in dissent in a case called Kleindienst versus Mandel, but he, you know, something that we should all be thinking about, teaching students and having this mindset among faculty and administrators is that the freedom to speak and the freedom to hear are inseparable. They're two sides of the same coin. When it comes to shouting down or disinviting speakers that show up on a campus, one also has to consider what about the people who wanted to listen to what that speaker wanted to say? What about the people who maybe wanted to listen to challenge them? You know, if you disagree with someone, there's definitely value in listening to what they have to say more than even listening to people you want to agree with because you want to figure out how does this person think? Uh, how could I make my retort? There's lots of value in listening to people you disagree with, but we don't see that a lot. Okay, and I just want to be very clear that the First Amendment does not protect all speech, but we have a short list of carve-outs for the First Amendment. So, uh, and the Supreme Court First Amendment ju jurisprudence has done a really good job of setting the bar high enough on these so that we are not sweeping in a lot of political speech or controversial speech or offensive speech, but also making sure that people can be physically safe from things like true threats and intimidation, or they can be, you know, physically and emotionally safe from harassment. These are not insurmountable bars, but somebody, a faculty member saying something in class that you disagree with is not going to meet the bar for, for example, discriminatory harassment. That's a much higher bar. For example, it, it requires severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive, unwelcome speech that's so serious it deprives the listener of their educational opportunities. So just a faculty member saying something you don't like in class or another student going off on Twitter about whatever is not going to meet that very high bar. And yet we hear these kinds of terms like threatening language or violent language or harassing language 
you know, really have undergone concept creep, and now people use them all the time as if they are unlawful, when in fact, most of the time, they are protected. Um, and again, you will not see hate speech on this list. Hate speech is not, is, hate speech is not a carve out of the First Amendment. It is protected because, you know, what is hate speech? We're going to talk about that in just a second here as I, as I sum up. But hate speech means different things to different people. The Supreme Court in a case called Snyder versus Phelps, which is the, you know, the Westboro Baptist church folks out on the sidewalk, outside soldiers' funerals, um, having lots of, you know, anti-homosexuality type uh, garb on and signs saying God hates fags. Uh, in uh, One of the soldiers' parents brought the Westboro Baptist Church folks to the Supreme Court and said, this is so disgusting. Almost nobody in our entire nation except these Westboro Baptist, you know, fringers would think this is acceptable speech. Why can't we suppress this hate speech? Almost everybody thinks it's hate speech. And in Snyder versus Phelps, the Supreme Court, you know, unanimously said, no, in the US, we have chosen a different route, which is to have our discourse be as wide open as possible. This speech did not rise to the level of a true threat or harassment. They were on a public sidewalk. We, you know, the cost of our freedoms is sometimes hearing speech we dislike because the contrary is a situation where we have to have the government decide which speech is okay and which speech isn't okay under the First Amendment. And I don't know if we want Donald Trump deciding that or Joe Biden deciding that or, you know, pick your least favorite politician. That's my favorite thought argument is, you know, exercises. Pick your least favorite politician and they get to decide what is hate speech. Just let that percolate a moment. Okay, this, and I am um, happy and burdened with the job of just presenting the problem, and then my other panelists are going to, like, raise all the solutions, and I'll answer some stuff in the Q&A, but I thought this AP article did a really good job of talking about all the different sides of this argument when it comes to how these laws that we just talked about are actually getting applied or not on our campuses. So these, you know, we've had generations of Americans who are like, yes, free expression, they know these laws, or at least they know the, I give people a lot of credit, but they know the, out, the contours of these laws. If you ask people, do you like free expression? Do you like free speech? People say, yes, but not that. Um, today, on many college campuses, there is a huge tension between uh, these sort of modern, but, you know, in the last century conceptions of free speech, and also younger generations who care a lot about how speech may cause, may cause harm. Um, and they are not looking at First Amendment jurisprudence and saying, you know, the bar for harassment needs to be severe, pervasive, and object objectively offensive. Instead, they're, you know, looking at themselves and their fellow students and saying, what makes you feel unsafe? What makes you feel uncomfortable? That alone should be the bar, and there's a conversation to be had around that, but what that looks like in practice are administrators starting to make those decisions subjectively about what speech is good and what speech isn't, what speech is allowed and what speech isn't, based on very flimsy criteria, and then we get into wow, all of a sudden we have a pal of orthodoxy on campus again, and we're violating these important First Amendment principles. But this, you know, this, this, uh, this AP article talked to uh, Caleb Ottman, who's a student at, at UW, and he's one of these students that says, you know, look, uh, you know, if your thought is predicated on the subjugation of me and my people, uh, then we have, we have problems. Why should I have to talk free speech if, you know, you won't recognize my humanity. Same, uh, you know, when it's talking about constitutional law. Was the First Amendment thinking about, has the First Amendment always been fair for everyone? Maybe we should have a conversation about that as well. Um, and then uh, this is a quote from 
Erwin Chemerinsky, noted uh, First Amendment scholar, um, and he said that I, you know he always hears now when students are upset or offended, as they phrase it, I feel unsafe. And I think it's so important that we separate out the campus duty that administrators have. It's not our role to make them safe from ideas they don't want it to be exposed to, but that line has gotten blurred. So we're, ju we're jumping right into the stickiness here, um, that there are not clean solutions. And of course there are pressures too, not just coming from students and faculty, but from uh, the U.S. Department of Education. And after October 7th, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, inquiries, investigations, calling college presidents before Congress to talk about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and people feel like, you know, colleges and universities now feel this sense of obligation on the part of these campuses to, to quote unquote do something and a lot of what and I think I'm going to stop here um, but beca just because of time even though I have more slides so whoever's on the slides may have to like zoom through a lot of my slides but um, I always like to have more rather than not enough we don't love dead air um, what we do at fire is say these concerns you know Curbing First Amendment rights is not the way to get to the heart of these concerns. Because what's at the core of, of a lot of this is it's such human stuff, right? Like we want to be able to show up authentically. We want to be able to connect with each other. People who are marginalized want to feel like they have a place on campus, whether that's you know racial or their first generation or they're ideologically um, you know the one conservative student on the you know super woke campus. We all want to be able to show up as we are, and especially on somewhere like a college campus, there's supposed to be nowhere better for us to have those discussions and come to the table. But what I hear from students and faculty is it's scary to show up as yourself unless you have the most you know, popular set of views right now. And so um, looking to what the law provides is very useful because if we start allowing college and university administrators to make decisions about which views are allowed and not, then we get into a situation where everything's politicized and um, and certain view, and we get the pal of orthodoxy on campus again. So I'm sure more problems abound from my other speakers, but I will stop now and cede the floor to who's next? Y'all. All right. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Yoel Enbar from the University of Toronto. Uh, thanks so much to the Thompson Center for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be able to be here and do this. Uh, so I'm a moral psychologist, so basically I think that moral psychology explains everything. Um, but I, I think in this case, uh, where we're talking about academic freedom and people's beliefs about what should be allowed on campus and not, uh, I think there really is a strong case that moral psychology can tell us a lot about what's motivating people's thinking here. So psychologists, when they're thinking about kind of a broad social concept or uh, a specific human behavior or whatever, uh, often they ask, what's it for? What does it do? What purpose does it serve, right? It's called a, a functionalist approach to, to thinking about uh, these sorts of concepts. Um, and I think that uh, when we're thinking about morality, that, that can have some real benefits of focusing on us. Okay, what, what functions does morality actually serve? So this is a, a quote defining morality um, as it's used by much of the of social scientific or social psychological literature um, comes from uh, the researcher John Haidt, one of his collaborators, and basically he defines morality uh, in terms of its function here as uh, a bunch of stuff that works together to suppress or regulate selfishness 
and makes cooperative social life possible, right? So we have these uh, selfish instincts or incentives. Somehow we need to regulate those in order to live successfully in a group. Morality helps us do that. Um, so what that means is that morality is inherently social. Not only is it about our rights and obligations with respect to other people, it's also about how we evaluate the behavior of others. A lot of morality is about seeing what did you do? Do I approve of it or disprove of it? Now, uh, cultural psychologists have pointed out that cultures kind of vary in the extent to which we care about what other people are doing. So that specific social element where we're looking out there and saying, is that thing the person did a good thing or a bad thing? So uh, so-called uh, tight cultures, and here you might think a paradigmatic example might be a traditional religious community. Here people care a lot about what other people are doing or thinking. Um, so they, these cultures just generally have uh, stronger moral norms. Uh, they're more uniform across the group, so we see less diversity in what people believe to be right and wrong. They're more coordinated. People talk a lot about what the moral norms should be, and we also see harsher sanctions for people who violate those norms. So in those kinds of cultures, not a good idea to step out of line morally. Whereas we might contrast that with, uh, say, Speaker's Corner in London, the UK, and this is kind of a paradigmatic case of the, the loose moral culture, right? You show up, you say your piece, everybody's welcome to do that, really. The only rule we have is that everybody can show up and have an opinion, right? So those are kind of the, the two extremes, and you might locate cultures on sort of a spectrum between those um, two extremes. Now, the question that I want to ask you to think about is, well, how should we consider academia? Is academia a morally loose culture, or is it a morally tight culture? I think uh, traditionally, at least in the time that I came up uh, as an academic, uh, we thought of uh, academia as the paradigmatically loose culture, right? So if you look back at things um, like the free speech movement at Berkeley, which Alex already touched on, really what this is about is our uh, right to go on campus and to say things that much of society might dislike or find offensive or whatever, and they can't forbid us from doing that, right? So we're, we're kind of setting ourselves up to violate or at least question these accepted social or moral norms. Um, if you look at the famous um, Calvin report from the University of Chicago, where the question they're trying to answer here is what is the university for, they give a very kind of um, in spirit, similar, morally loose definition where they say, uh, by, by design and effect, we're going to create discontent with existing social arrangements, right? Our job here is to question. You might not like that questioning. In fact, if you're doing it right, you probably won't like some of what we're going to say, but that's our job. I'm going to suggest, however, that there's been some signs over the last, like, let's say, 20 years or so of what I would describe as a moral tightening in academia. Um, so I'm going to show you some uh, reasons to think that uh, and, and, and then some consequences. So first of all, we see now more coordinated and uniform social, uh, moral norms, or at least the attempt to establish them. So as I mentioned, I'm a psychologist. Our main professional organization in social and personality psychology is SPSB. If you look on their website, they have this as their uh, singular guiding principle. Um, there's only one guiding principle. This is it. OK, so regardless of what you think of the um, the costs and benefits of, of pursuing this sort of a policy, you know, you might think it's a really good idea, but it's indisputable that as a moral principle, it's a lot narrower than just go find out what's true, right? It's coordinating a norm that says we should be focusing on specific things, right? That should be our uh, focus as a field, and therefore it's inherently tighter, right? It's more coordinated um, and therefore tighter. We also see, um, you've probably seen slides like this before, greater ideological uniformity over the years among university faculty. Uh, so this is a graph. Um, this, these are probability surveys of US academics. And you can see that uh, across the years covered here, so on the x-axis, we're going from uh, 1990 uh, to 2014, that we always start uh, with a kind of a left-leaning um, trend overall, um, but that, that is exacerbated over time. So if you look at the liberal conservative ratio, um, this is um, self-description by these respondents 
Uh, you see it's about uh, two to one uh, liberal conservative in 1990, and then at the end of the time series of 2014, we get to about six to one, so a, a real increase there over time. As we get more politically uniform, we get more morally uniform as well, right? We agree more on what's good and what's bad, who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, who the uh, teams we should be joining are versus the teams that we should be opposing. So when you have um, moral tightening, uh, you see some predictable consequences, as I mentioned. Uh, the first is that you see more sanctioning, uh, more punishment, uh, formal or informal, of norm violators, so people who uh, question or push a ba back against uh, the norms that the group shares. So what I'm showing you here is data from uh, surveys of uh, university professors and uh, the gray and the orange bars, uh, those are surveys not selected um, on ideology, and the blue bars are from the National Association of Scholars, which is a conservative-leaning group. So basically, uh, the blue bars are people who are more conservative on average than are uh, the orange and the gray bars. And these are different uh, disciplinary actions or informal social sanctions uh, that you might face because of something touching on politics that you did or said. That's how the questions were phrased to the respondents. So did these things happen to you as a consequence of in some way expressing your, your views? Um, and these are things that range at the top um, from things that are quite serious, like literal physical harm, uh, thankfully quite rare. In the middle, you might think of this as kind of administrative sanctions, like did they give you more unpleasant admin tasks to do, for example. Um, and at the bottom, uh, you can think of these as informal social sanctions. So do people not like you? Do they say mean things to you? Do they not want to hang out with you, et cetera? You can see that for all of these categories, the blue bars are higher, right? So right-leaning faculty are facing this sort of stuff more. It's the biggest for the informal social sanctions, very consistent with how we enforce moral norms. Often, that's done in an informal way, right? You tell people, hey, I really don't like your behavior. You shouldn't be doing that. Uh, together with a collaborator, I collected some data now, um, yeah, more than 10 years ago, from, from our own field of social personality psychology. And here we asked respondents, uh, these were selected from our professional uh, email list serve, um, how willing would you be to discriminate against conservatives or conservative work in these different areas? Um, it looks like we're missing a couple x-axis labels here. So far left is uh, reviewing a grant. The middle one, missing, is reviewing a paper. Uh, that one, inviting somebody to speak in a symposium. Far right is hiring. So the way we phrased this was always, if you felt that the work took a politically conservative perspective or if you knew the person to be conservative, would you be, for example, less willing to hire them, less willing to invite them to come speak on a, uh, on a panel, uh, less likely to, rem uh, to recommend their grant to be funded, and so on. Um, and you can see the blue bars are what would you do, and the purple bars are what do you think your colleagues would do. Here are substantial percentages say, I'd be somewhat or very willing to discriminate against conservative uh, scholars or research. Even more so, they think that their colleagues would do that. Right? And um, we, we included this colleagues question because we thought maybe people aren't willing to fess up to it. Um, often in social science research, we can ask, what do you think other people would do? You know, do other people dislike this minority group? And that's a way of getting at biases that the respondent themselves might not want to admit. Here we have plenty of people who are willing to admit, yeah, I'd do that. But consistent with that path research, an even greater number of people who say, oh, other people would do it. Right? So as a kind of outspoken conservative, you face real obstacles here. The, the highest willingness to discriminate is the far right, which is getting hired from a job, for a job, like uh, probably the most consequential of the outcomes um, that we asked about. So we definitely see some uh, formal and informal sanctioning or kind of stated willingness to sanction here, um, both when you ask people who are you know, like the targets uh, possibly of the sanctioning, or when you ask people who are in the position to do the sanctioning, like the liberal majority, progressive majority, who's in a position to discriminate against the conservative minority. Okay, I um, want to talk about one more consequence here. This is more of an uh, epistemic consequence, like a consequence for our ability to ask questions or know things. Uh, this phrase, heretical counterfactuals, um, comes from the psychologist Phil Tetlock. I believe he did this work at, uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, couple decades ago. So his idea was when you moralize an issue, there's certain questions that become offensive. Just asking the question becomes offensive. He was interested in this actually in the context of uh, religious belief. 
So he asked uh, religious believers and non-believers, if they were b religious, they, they were all Christian in this case, to consider this counterfactual. Uh, now, in case you don't know the biblical story, what happened here is Joseph was going to marry Mary, Mary, um, and uh, it turned out she was pregnant, and he was concerned by this, right? He's like, okay, maybe I don't want to marry this woman who's, I guess, been around. God sent an angel down to reassure Joseph and to tell him, no, no, it's okay. You know, she, she has not been sleeping around. Um, this is a, you know, a, a divine pregnancy, and you can go ahead and marry her. It turns out in the biblical story, yes, you know, he, he uh, buys what the angel is selling, and, you know, they, they end up getting married. Uh, and now what, the, what this counterfactual asks the respondent to consider is, well, maybe if he wasn't persuaded, then what would have happened, right? Jesus would have grown up presumably in a, a single parent household. He might have turned out quite different psychologically. We know that there's you know, differences between growing up in a single parent household versus dual parent household. Um, might that have affected his eventual personality? Now, if you're a religious believer, you might find this to be a little offensive. And that is what um, Tetlock found. So on the, here, he's binning people by their level of religious belief, low, moderate, or high. Um, and these are our different outcome measures that he asked people about. So do they resist the counterfactual? Do they say, well, that, does, that question doesn't even make sense, or I can't even think about that counterfactual in a way that's sensible, uh, that's higher in the high believers? Are they morally outraged? Um, do they say they're disgusted? Do they say they would ostracize the person who's asking this counterfactual question? Uh, this great, this is a very Tetlockian phrase, strained forbearance. Basically, <laughs> basically what it means is like they don't like the guy, right? They, they think bad things about him. Right, so in all of these things, the high believers are elevated. So when you ask people who have um, a moral commitment uh, in a certain area, certain questions, they start to react very negatively. Um, now, consider a different moral commitment that you might have um, to increasing diversity in the faculty. And then you can get into a position where asking a question like, do diversity statements work in order to benefit underrepresented groups? What are the pros and cons? might to some people be offensive, right? Even asking that sort of a question might start to evoke the same kinds of outrage responses, um, which I you know, learned personally when, I don't know, like five years ago, I recorded a podcast with a co-host where we sort of went back and forth about diversity statement pros and cons. That later came to light. People didn't like it, right? They found that to be very upsetting. And we didn't, in the podcast at all, come out one way or the other, but the very nature of asking questions about it once you have a moralized commitment. If that is, uh, if that's seen as transgressing or uh, questioning, calling those moral values into question, people can react quite negatively. Okay, so in my last few minutes, I'm just gonna talk about the, some of the benefits and costs of tightness versus looseness. So there are upsides to tight moral cultures, particularly they help you get things done. Right? There's less arguing, there's less disagreement. When you already know what the right answer is, having a tighter group allows you to get to that good outcome more quickly. Right? Let's say you're slavery abolitionists. You don't want to include people who are like, well, you know, maybe some upsides of slavery. Right? You want to draw a tight boundary there. So there can be upsides. But there's also going to be costs, predictably, to a tighter culture. The first is going to be reputational. So if the kind of US public perceives us academics as being very different from them, as having very different kind of moral norms and standards. You know, as we are politically, you know, progressive left is a small minority of the US electorate. Um, they're going to uh, start to side eye us. And we can see that in the data here where we look at people's trust in higher education over the years. So this goes um, from 2015 to 2023. So in those eight years, you see a 20 point drop in people who say they trust uh, higher ed quite a lot or a great deal. Some of this is Republicans, of course, but not all. A lot of independents and even Democrats are uh, showing these same sorts of declines. Now, I'm not gonna say this is all about politics, right? There's other stuff going on in here as well, but I think politics and the perceived kind of um, unique political views held by academia are certainly playing a role here. Equally serious, I think, as a scientist, and particularly a social scientist, is what uniformity does to our ability to self-correct. Right? So uh, this is from a kind of a classic philosophy of science paper by Ernest Nagel, who says, you know, particularly when it comes to social science, there's just no way to remove bias. Bias, like by which I mean the individual 
researcher thinks some outcome is better to some other outcome, some state of the world is preferable to some other state of the world, can creep in at all phases of the research project, right? How you analyze your data, how you design your instruments, even the questions that you choose to ask. And just saying really forcefully, I'm not gonna be biased, doesn't work. A lot of our bias is invisible to us, right? It's not possible for us to surmount it consciously, at least not entirely. So what we need is a spirit of uh, adversarial collaboration where we agree that we're all going to criticize each other's work, that we're all gonna look for flaws in each other's work, and through that collaborative process, where we all bring different biases to the table, we can cancel them out, right? So if you are designing your questionnaire in such a way that bakes in your politics, I, perhaps having different politics, would be in a position to spot that. Here's the key, though. You need the diversity of opinion in order for this to work. Right? If we all share the same biases, then we're gonna be very much impaired in our ability to self-correct. Right? You can't spot the bias that the whole field, hold, the whole field holds. Um, and so I think that uh, that, uh, for us, in social science, is going to be uh, a huge challenge. How do we eliminate the bias that just is inevitably inherent in what we do if we don't have the kind of diversity that allows us to spot it? Okay, so, um, I'm, in order to leave time for the other presentations and uh, some discussion, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, I'm George Yancey, I'm from Baylor University. And uh, I used to live in Wisconsin for three years, so thanks for bringing me on a beautiful day in March. Because I've been in Wisconsin three years, so I know March is not always beautiful in Wisconsin. Uh, I want to build on some of y'all's work, because I think uh, some of my work really does build on y'all's work. And I want to talk about addressing academic silos. And I think that that's, that's a very major thing that we should consider. So I wanna, what I first want to do is I just want to uh, do a little research showing uh, the formation and, and kind of some evidence of that. And then I want to look at one issue and the effects of it, and then I'll try to address some potential uh, solutions as I see them. So, uh, several years ago, probably, probably 15 years ago, I had this question, and I sent out to academics in about nine different departments, uh, in the hard sciences, social sciences, humanities. And the basic question, you can read it, is if you found out someone had a certain characteristic, would you be more or less willing to hire that person? And uh, I had about 26 different characteristics, you know, there were religious, political, lifestyle. I went through hunter and vegetarian in there just to see what anything come up, nothing came up. So, uh, so, I, so I'll, we'll focus on a few of them because I think that this is very interesting. So I'm just gonna show you the amalgamation of all the professors from all nine disciplines and uh, show you some, some, some results. So we're gonna look at, I asked about uh, fundamentalists, evangelicals, NRA members, Republicans, Muslims, and atheists, all right? And that's out of, out of that 26. And so here's my chart. So the top part is whether or not they stated, the answer to the question is, find out this about this person enhances my chances of hiring them. And the bottom part is it damages their chances. Now some of them damages greatly, some slightly, but damages. I, just, I don't have time to really break it down into all of that. And as you see, that the uh, gray is the atheist, and for if you're an atheist, uh, being an atheist, your chances of being hired, if people find out you're an atheist, is enhanced more than damage. And that's the only group that that's true. Uh, for all the other groups, that's not true. Uh, and especially not true if you're a fundamentalist or a, an evangelical or an NRA member. It's especially not true in that. It's, it's a little, you know, if you're a Muslim, if there's some, some problems, some issues, Republican, uh, even more issues, but it's really not true for those groups. And that actually surprised me because I thought there'd be more of a political bias than religious bias going into this. Uh, so, so anyways, so what does this do? If these people are, 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 are answering this question honestly, and I have no reason to think they're not, one of the reasons, what we're, do, what we're doing is we're, we're screening out people. If you find out that they have different religious political beliefs and only allowing certain people into our academia, and this creates academic silos. Silos of people with similar thoughts. And what we know is that when you're around people who think the way that you, you do, you become overconfident in how right you feel you are. 
So if I'm just around people who, who you know, are Longhorn fans, uh, I become extremely confident that, man, the Longhorns, we are going to win the national championship next year. Next year's our year. Uh, and, and that's just true, all right? Now, what is, what is the ramifications of this? And here I want to switch a little bit. It sounds like I'm going in a different direction, but I'll, I'll come back to this. All right, what does this truly mean? Well, one of the things it means is, what do we research? So let me give you a, a couple of fact points, because there's been a lot of talk, especially now in election year, about white evangelicals and their political activism, right? You, 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 can't, you can't turn around without hearing about Christian nationalists, evangelicals, and atheists. Remember, atheists was the group that, okay, you're an atheist, we're more likely to hire you. All right, so you, you can see that uh, white evangelicals and atheists, atheists are slightly more likely to talk to someone about voting against a candidate, uh, more likely to attend a political rally, more likely to work for a political party, l less likely to give money to a political party, and more likely to contact a federal official. In fact, when it comes to white evangelicals, according to uh, what Ryan Burge has shown, you know, white evangelicals are kind of in the middle when it comes to political activism. You know, per capita, they're not the most politically active group. In fact, you know, there's a lot of groups, atheists and, and others, who are more politically active than they are. Well, maybe it's the political activity. You know, we talk about white nationalism, maybe it's because white evangelicals are uniquely authoritarian to other groups. Well, I did some work several years ago when, when uh, I sent a survey out uh, and uh, I asked questions about authoritarianism, which groups that were willing to pass laws against. And once again, I'm comparing now white born-again Protestants to atheists and agnostics, just the, that's just the way I, I had broken down. And here we go. So, this is supporting outlawing certain things. So support outlawing abortion protesters. Well, uh, people are protest abortion. Atheist agnostics are much more likely to support outlawing abortion protesters. Support outlawing preaching against same-sex marriage. Once again, atheist agnostics, more likely to. Support outlawing co communist activists. Here are the white Protestants. So what I'm not trying to say is atheist agnostics are more authoritarian. It depends on the issue, right? And the last one is the most interesting one because, all right, I get it, white, pro, pro, white born again protesters, they're going to support abortion protesters. Uh, they're going to support preaching against same sex marriage because it's a political thing. Uh, there's reasons to believe that. But when it comes to uh, various religious cults, they're not crazy about religious cults, but neither are the atheists or agnostics. And yet here, the atheists and agnostics uh, are, are more likely to outlaw, support outlawing various religious cults. Now, once again, I'm not making a direct comparison, and, and to be honest, the direct comparison I've seen of, of, of white evangelicals to uh, people who are atheist agnostics as far as authoritarianism has bad questioning. I'm not saying this is the solution. What I'm saying is that I think we have evidence that when it comes to authoritarianism, it's not just limited to white evangelicals. As authoritarianism is not there. And in fact, when we talk about cancer culture, which is a type of authoritarianism. And, and people say, hey, there's ways in which white evangelicals do that or white Protestants do that, yes. But we know that most of it's not done by them. So what have we done in academia? Well, let me show you what we've done in academia. This is the, the books, Critical of Political Activism of White Evangelicals since 2020. That's three, and, three years and three months ago, right? So let's look at at the books that have tried to address this issue. These books are of varying qualities. <laughs> some of them are quite good, some of them are mm mm mm, -mm. Uh, But you can see, we, you know, that's eight, and uh, I did this like about six months ago, so there may be, I think one or two more have come up since then. Uh, so these are the books talking about. It. Now I wanna be very clear, you know, I, I'm not, I'm obviously not a white evangelical, but, uh, but I am an evangelical. Uh, I don't oppose writing about the shortcomings of white evangelicals. I'm not against that. There are, there are issues that need to be addressed. I've tried to address it with some of my evangelical brothers and sisters, all right? But here's my problem, all right? This is my problem. Here are the books, uh, Critical of Political Activism, It is Agnostics 2020. Yes, there are the books, <laughs> Critical of It is Agnostics since 2020. And if, you, if there was one book on there, I guarantee you it would not be as, as toxic 
as some of the books there on the previous list. My problem is when you do this, you create this image that the authoritarianism is only by white evangelicals and not by other groups that are out there. And if, you, if that's the only thing addressed, what you do is you, you actually set up a situation where you could do authoritarianism. As long as it's not done by the white evangelicals, we're OK with it. And we think of examples and examples of this. So my problem is not just, hey, you know, it's not, you're picking on the evangelicals. My problem is this is bad science. And we're not getting an accurate viewpoint of what society looks like. All right. So here's the consequences of academic silos. And in the spirit of this, I, do, I am going to su suggest some possible directions. Uh, distortion of science. You know, there's, every now and then, I'm on Twitter, I see Christian nationalism pop up again. You know, it's a constant thing. And I'm not saying that it doesn't exist or it's not a problem, but it's not the only problem with authoritarianism. Science is distorted. Loss of public trust. We've already seen that. The, tr the public does not trust us. Nor why should they? Because if you're out there and you realize that authoritarianism is not just from white evangelicals and that's all you hear about from science, why would you trust science? It deepens societal polarization. The way we're doing science is we sort of overwhelmingly pick a side. And so we are now a members of a team rather than calling balls and strikes. And then it creates a backlash. And Florida is a great example of this. Florida not only has had the backlash against DEI, but Florida has recently stated that you can't use sociology <laughs> in order to meet curriculum requirements. Now, as you're about to find, find, find in a few minutes, I don't agree with Florida, but I understand Florida. There's a difference there. Because if you've seen all this happen, and you go, OK, well, it, now we have political power. Now it's our turn. And people then tend to overreact. So it gives me some time to, just, to now spend some time on the future direction. What direction should we go? And I don't see a clock up here. Uh, so if I go over the board, throw something at me. All right, first thing, don't do Florida. I don't think the solution is a tax scientific inquiry. The solution is better inquiry. And just because there, there has been legitimate problems that what I was called religious and political deviants in academia have faced, and they're legitimate, that does not mean that we try to do the same thing against others. So what Florida is doing, while I understand it, is wrong, it's going to create more problems. And what I often tell my conservative friends is, look, you know, the things you're doing, who's going to ha what happens when the other type team has the power and you've given these tools? You give them additional tools. Uh, I've had some of my friends say, well, we need to not build mosques. Well, what? Well, come on, dude, you know how anti-Christian some legislators are. What happens when you start doing that and now they pass laws against your churches? So for a variety of reasons, while it's understandable, this is not the direction to go into. Uh, and I'll just say this, you know, on the whole, the president's in front of Congress. What the president's got right was, no, you should not monitor speech that may be anti-Semitic. What well, the president got wrong is they hadn't been doing that before, and so I, you don't believe them. And so I, I get why they are in trouble. They deserve to be in trouble, but for the wrong reasons. They got in trouble for the wrong reasons. They should have stood up for free speech, but they couldn't because they hadn't been doing it. Work towards awareness. You know, it is very difficult to, to, to have the sort of uh, self-introspection. And it's something that we, we strive to do all the time. We, no, we don't strive to do it. We should strive to do it all the time, to, uh, to think about, all right, how would I put this if there was someone who was different from me? And, and, and I, I like the, the image, you know, if you like these laws uh, that's going against this group, how would you like it if it was in the political person that you hate the most? Uh, and, and how would you feel about that? So let's work towards awareness. Let's be aware. Uh, oftentimes when I bring up some of these issues, when, when I talk about, hey, you know, for certain groups in academia, they don't, they don't get a fair shake. People go, well, you know, those groups are, you know, sexist and racist and homophobic. They don't deserve a fair shake. When 20, 30 years ago, people would say, well, well you're, you know, your group was communist and, 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 and hates, you know, and, and hates uh, farmers and, and all this sort of stuff. You don't deserve a fair shake. Be aware of your own biases as much as we possibly can be. 
what I really think is important is the fun alternatives. So if you want to study Christian nationalism, there's a grip of money out there. If you want to study authoritarianism among progressives, that money dries up really fast. Okay? So I'm not saying let's not fund studying Christian nationalism, but let's fund other possible, let's create money. If we want to create incentives, let's create positive money, and the person's money is to study X, and X goes against the grain. You know, people will go where money goes. And we academics, we, we talk to high mind, yeah, we like the money too. All right? Uh, I know, because I'm in sociology of religion, and for a while, religion was on the outs in academia. And then a couple of big funders, like Lilly and such, said, hey, we want to fund religion. And all of a sudden, academics said, hey, I can study religion now. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So you will, you will the, mon the money, the resources, it can create flows towards studying alternatives. And if we want to see some books out there that you know, assess authoritarianism in a non-white evangelical spaces, then there has to be funding out there. You don't have to worry about funding money for Christian nationalism. It's out there. The, the, the money, the funding for other alternatives, that's what's lacking. Proactively recruit scholars with different ideas. Now, you know, there's, there's people talking about should we hire uh, people of, of, of different ideas. Of course we should, but should we, you know, target and say, hey, you must hire them. I think that if we can figure out how to recruit people of different ideas, and we do this, I study race, we do this with racial issues. So we talk about, well, you know, you advertise in communities of, you know, color, you know, where, where, what they're reading. You, uh, you figure out what their needs are, you intentionally go to recruit them. I think we have to start doing that, thinking about that when it comes to people who do not follow toe the line, politically, socially, religiously, if we want them to be part of academia. We have to be proactive. We can't say, we are open, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna punish you if you come, that's not enough. We have to take care of the fact that sometimes they are punished when they come, but more than that, we have to proactively. Does that mean maybe scholarships, just like we have minority scholarships? It may mean that. We have to start thinking along these lines in order to change this dynamic. Because well, the, the, the answer is not to force conservative ideas that people throw out. The answer is to bring conservatives in and to get rid of the silos. Research has shown that when you're around people who, who disagree with you, you may not change your ideas, but you tend to moderate them because all of a sudden you have a living, breathing person right in front of you, and then that person has ideas, and you have to contend with them. And if we want to get away from this polarization and, and not be just on the side and call balls and strikes, we're going to bring in people who can help us to see things differently, see things you know, in a way that we hadn't seen before. And what we do know is when there's diversity of perspective, we tend to have better ideas. So these are some of the suggestions that I have. I think that was all of them. Yeah, these are some suggestions I have on how we can improve and uh, how we can address this issue. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the Tommy Thompson Center and to my fellow panelists and to everyone in today's audience. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I don't have PowerPoint. I don't know whether I should, you know, apologize or take a bow. Um, but today I'm going to talk about one particular solution to the problems that universities face on issues of free speech. Um, and that, that solution is institutional neutrality um, and its central role in creating an environment that is conducive to free speech. But first I want to just take a few seconds to tell you about the Martin Center, which is where I, where I work. Um, the Martin Center is a private educational nonprofit focused on public policy solutions to critical issues in higher education. Um, we um, have been a voice for excellence in higher education since 2003. We are particularly interested in responsible governance, viewpoint diversity and free speech, academic quality, cost-effective ed education solutions, and innovative market-based reform. And we are located in Raleigh, North Carolina, and have a kind of a special focus on our home state. 
uh, but also want to export good policies to states and trustees and boards across the nation. Um, so as I said, I'm going to talk about institutional neutrality today, and I think it's just one piece of the puzzle. It's not the only solution to the problems that uh, universities are facing. Um, it's, but it's one piece, and I think it's an important piece to creating the right environment on campus. Um, so institutional neutrality is the guiding principle that institutions of higher education should not take collective action on contemporary political and social issues that the individual faculty and, sorry, and that the, the individual faculty member or student is the appropriate agent for engaging in political action, not the institution itself. A university's role is to foster such engagement, but not engage itself. Um, and you'll put part of the Calvin, uh, Calvin report uh, up on his slide, so I, I was happy to see that. Um, and the, um, and that's the report from which this concept comes. Um, it's officially titled, the committee, the Calvin Report is officially titled, The Committee on the University Role in Political and Social Action, Report on the University's Role in Political and Social Action. Uh, the report, report came out of the University of Chicago in 1967, and since 1967, it kind of just sat there at the University of Chicago. Chicago adopted it, it was the University of Chicago's um, principle that it would not take action on a collective action on various issues um, and until 2022 the University of Chicago was the only university in the nation that had made such a commitment um, the report emphasizes the importance of the university as a place for free and open inquiry asserting that the university should remain neutral on political and social matters as an institution um, the report argued that while individual members of the university community were entitled to express their personal views, the university as an entity should avoid taking official positions. Um, and I'm going to read from the report briefly here. It says, the instrument of dissent and criticism is the individual faculty member of the in or the individual student. The university is the home and sponsor of critics. It is not the itself the critic. It is, to go back once again to the classic phrase, a community of scholars. To perform its mission in the society, a university must sustain an extraordinary environment of freedom of inquiry and maintain an independence from political fashions, passions, and pressures. A university, if it is to be true to its faith in intellectual inquiry, must embrace, be hospitable to, and encourage the wildest, widest, not wildest, but that happens too, um, widest diversity of views within its own community. It is a community, but only for the limited, albeit great, purposes of teaching and research. It is not a club. It is not a trade association. It is not a lobby. Since the university is a community only for these limited and distinctive purposes, it is a community which cannot take collective action on the issues of the day without endangering the conditions for, ex for its existence and effectiveness. There is no mechanism by which it can reach a collective position without inhibiting the full freedom of dissent on which it thrives. It cannot insist that all of its members favor a given view of social policy. If it takes collective action, therefore, it does so at the price of cens censuring any minority who do not agree with the view adopted. In brief, it is a community which cannot resort to majority vote to reach positions on public issues. You might be thinking to yourself that this sounds more like a limitation on free speech than an aid to free speech. Um, but I would argue that it is a necessary precondition for free speech of the individual. Um, and in principle and in law, institutional neutrality differs in important ways from other free speech protections. Um, campus free expression policies, the kind that the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression will often uh, talk about and defend, um, protect the rights of individuals to speak freely within broad and neutral parameters. Institutional neutrality, on the other hand, ensures that such speech is attributed only to individuals and never to the institution itself. Free expression is protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. Institutional neutrality needs additional um, 
separate protections in university policy. Uh, institutional neutrality means that there is no institutional opinion on controversial issues, which leaves open more room for the opinions of all the individuals who are part of the university community. Institutional neutrality ensures that the university never speaks on behalf of members of the university community on behalf of other members of the university in ways with, with which they don't agree. Institutional neutrality prevents majority opinion from becoming an inviolable campus orthodoxy, or at least goes some way to making sure that that doesn't happen. And institutional neutrality recognizes that unanimity of opinion does not exist on university campuses and makes room for viewpoint diversity and healthy dissent. I think it, obviously in principle, you can understand why this is an important thing for universities to adopt. But I think that you know, part of my job is to sell university administrators on, on adopting such policies. And I think they can also be very, very beneficial for uh, administrators themselves, for students, and for other people on campus. Um, obviously, the, the first benefit is that it encourages debate and dissent by ensuring that there's no official line. And so you get that important checks on the biases that is, exist, so it's good for scientific inquiry. Um, but it also prevents administrators from being pressured to take positions or make public statements on controversial issues that are irrelevant to university business. Imagine if, following the recent events in Israel, Harvard President Claudine Gay could say, honestly, that Harvard follows a policy of institutional neutrality and that this means that Harvard leadership will not take a position on external events. Um, and that Harvard recognizes that these events might have an effect on, on people on campus, therefore we will provide resources if you need counseling or any other kind of attention. But as a university, we're not making a statement about Israel. I think she would have avoided a lot of problems. Of course, this avenue was not open to Harvard. Harvard has made statements about every political issue under the sun. And therefore, when President Gay tried to hem and haw and not make statements about Israel, um, the double standard, double standard was immediately obvious. But if Harvard had all along taken the same position as the University of Chicago, it could have saved itself a lot of trouble. Um, Institutional neutrality also benefits faculty because it ensures, it empowers faculty by ensuring that they never have to take positions in opposition to official university statements. Right now, there are faculty members on Harvard's campus, on other campuses across the country, who find themselves at odds with the official university position on, on various issues that are external to what's going on at the university. And that is a, that's a difficult position to be in for faculty. It's an even harder position to be in for students who are young, who are still forming their opinions. And we know from extensive research that self-censorship is a huge problem among students. And so if the students know that there is an official university position on Ukraine, on Black Lives Matter, on Israel, on any other external event, they're going to be less likely to want to form their own opinions or to want to speak their own opinions or to want to have uh, open inquiry about those issues because they're going to feel the pressure of going against the official university line. Uh, it also frees universities from distraction. If you take a position of institutional neutrality, you don't get caught up in this you know, congressional circus that we're having right now. Um, you don't have to spend time on something that is outside of the university's mission. Um, and adopting institutional neutrality would also, I think, go a long way to improving the public trust in universities. I think universities see, or sorry, the public sees university presidents making these, these statements quite often on external issues, and they think, that, you know, that, what, what are they doing? Like that has that has nothing to do with teaching and learning. You know, why are they opining on 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 all of these kind of external 
um, international and domestic and political issues that have nothing to do with the university's mission. Uh, that said, neutrality does not prevent institutions from addressing topics that affect their mission and their operations. It's only about external issues. So important but controversial internal issues are still on the table. So whether or not to use standardized tests, uh, the use of diversity statements in hiring, how NIL will impact sports, um, all of these are fair game. Universities should be, um, should probably have, you know, they have these policies, which means they have taken a position on this. Um, but those are internal issues to the university. And I think often people are confused about, well, where's the line? Well, the line is internal versus external issues. Um, and it's not, it's not, that's not to say that it's easy to thread that needle. Um, my alma mater is UNC Chapel Hill, and it was the first public university to adopt institutional neutrality in July of 2022. Um, and so it found itself in the position of trying to figure out what to do um, when, um, when war broke out in Israel. Because there was pressure from many, many people to make statements uh, who didn't know that UNC had adopted institutional neutrality, um, including pressure from the conservative legislature in North Carolina for, UN, for the UNC chancellor to make a statement. Um, and so the chancellor at the time and the provost um, did say something about the events. And here's, here's what they said. They said, we have a commitment to allow both internal and external groups to express their opinions under the First Amendment, even views some find repugnant. We are also committed to institutional neutrality on political matters, but we cannot remain neutral about behaviors that are corrosive to the campus climate or threaten members of our community. We all deserve to live and work on our campus safely without fear of being targeted by hateful speech. We are disappointed by some of the messaging we have seen and heard in our classrooms, on our sidewalks, and in social media posts aimed at members or groups in our community. We call on our community to lead by example by engaging in peaceful dialogues. Let us demonstrate how people of different backgrounds and perspectives can come together and truly listen and learn from each other in an environment where everyone can feel safe and respected. And I'll leave it to the audience and my fellow panelists to be the judges of whether that message strikes the right balance. Um, and as more universities adopt institutional neutrality, um, they will likely face the same challenges. Um, the university felt compelled to say something because there were protests all over campus, which is clearly an internal issue. But the actual war in Israel is an external one. So it, it is a difficult needle to thread, but I think it's still, it, it is worth, worth, very much worth doing. Um, and I think that with everything that's going on right now, universities are starting to see that institutional neutrality will help them um, create a better climate for speech and viewpoint diversity on campus. So maybe it's something of a new trend. Um, some states have made laws to protect free and open thought on college campuses, including North Carolina, where I'm from. Um, and one of those laws that, that North Carolina's is modeled on is um, model legislation from the Goldwater Institute. Um, I believe FIRE has model legislation as well. I don't know if FIRE's model has institutional neutrality in it. So you can, we just you just did it. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Um, <laughs> um, but the Goldwater um, model legislation, uh, which is the one I'm most familiar with, has a special focus on institutional neutrality in that model. Um, it states that colleges and universities should aspire to institutional neutrality, meaning that they shouldn't take sides or make statements on controversial issues. Um, but it also states that public universities may not take action as an institution on the public policy controversies of the day in such a way to require students, faculty, or administrators to publicly express a given view or policy. Um, however, the most common way is not legislation. The most common way that universities have adopted institutional neutrality up to this point um, is for uh, faculty committees or boards of trustees to endorse the Calvin Report. Um, and this has been done by roughly 20 colleges and universities across the country. Nine of those institutions are in North Carolina, which makes me very excited. None of them, sadly, are here in Wisconsin. 
Um, and it is, it is a mix of public and private institutions at this point. Um, I'm hoping it will be more of a trend. As I said before, my alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill, was the first public university to adopt the Calvin Report in July of 2022. And that resolution passed unanimously, the Board of Trustees, and has since been embraced by university administration, by university faculty, um, and by everyone on campus as, you know, especially with what's going on right now, as a possible way to try to um, calm some of the, the loud and you know, ugly disagreements that are going on right now. Um, and I strongly urge other university trustees to consider this when they're thinking about a suite of solutions to the problems of speech, viewpoint diversity, and campus climate, that institutional neutrality should be in that mix. Thank you. So we'll move into uh, Q and A. I have uh, a few of my own, but I want to leave a lot of the time for for ones from the audience. Um, I already have a number of them that have been passed up, uh, but if you have more, um, please either uh, pass them up and or uh, uh, or let us know, and we can ask them out loud. So I wanted to just start by asking um, uh, something that I've, uh, I've heard sometimes that if we include sort of social conservatives on campus or at least certain types of social conservatives, that will inherently exclude other people. That if we include people who are uh, you know, critical of uh, LGBT rights, that will exclude people who are LGBT, uh, if we, you know, exclude people or include people who are critical of uh, transgenderism that will exclude people who are trans uh, and and so on so uh, how much of a tension is there and how should universities address that I'll open it up to anybody right well hello well, I mean, almost every university I know that's not a Christian university has an atheist club on there, and so uh, they're very critical of religious people, and so by having them, are we, are we excluding religious people? I mean, you know, uh, either we're allowed to critique each other or we're not. If we're not allowed to critique them, that should go to everyone. And, and if it's not, then we're picking winners and losers instead of being umpires. And so that, that reasoning falls apart uh, once we start looking at other examples. I just have something to add. Um, I mean, th you know, when you talk about institutional neutrality, for example, that's like a healthy campus climate for free expression. I like to think of it as like a, a healthy stock, you know, a diversified stock portfolio, for example. Like something like institutional neutrality is an important piece of the puzzle, but so is a mindset around free expression and the idea of like, what do we do here at a university? Like, we sh should we expect to hear views we agree with or should we expect to hear views we disagree with? And I think a lot of those questions, you know, they don't come up so much at schools like the University of Chicago where Calvin originated and where they have the Chicago Statement on Free Expression and where from application to graduation we have this sort of, you know, drumbeat of the university saying like, when you come here to UChicago, you will hear views you disagree with, and that's just like baked in to this university. When people have that mindset, they're not looking for who's out to get me, who's out to, you know, blow me up on Twitter or X because I have this view. No, people are sort of expecting to hear different views, and it allows them to show up authentically and more openly, and I think there's a vulnerability there. So I think a lot of 
what I would, you know, the sign of the, the biggest sign when, you know, FIRE has been trying to solve the free speech crisis for 20 years and we've failed every year and we, you know, continue to try to put ourselves out of business. But when I start seeing more people open to hearing views that they disagree with and hearing, seeking out, you know, people who disagree with them, that's going to be, you know, the heartbeat coming back on the monitor. That's what I would like to see. So uh, a little bit of that, I think, leads into the, as I think what I had asked, which is just how much, how far can we get with top-down solutions? So even something like institutional neutrality even, uh, first, how far can we get with that? And second of all, how much is that going to run into a principal agent problem where if the people actually on the ground, if the administrators or individual faculty don't buy into it, that that won't get anywhere, so. I think that getting the policies right are, as I said, a ne necessary precondition to getting the environment right. Um, but it is by no means the only step. You have, to, you have to get the policies right and then you do have to address those cultural issues and those are harder. Those are way harder to get right than the policy issues. Um, you know, a, a legislature can adopt free speech policies. We've got the First Amendment. In theory, that should, that should solve the problem at our public universities, right? Uh, but the implementation on campus is a lot harder. Um, and you do need buy-in. I think it is extremely important to get buy-in from faculty, from fr trustees, and from other people on campus who can lead by example um, in order to make the environment one that, um, that is conducive to free speech, that is open to free speech. Um, and I think that there are things that can be done top-down to improve the environment, such as, actually surveying students about how they feel about free speech. Are you self-censoring? What are the problems that you see on campus? Um, but there are, there are certainly limits. Yeah, I, I found uh, George's take here to be pretty compelling and as sort of a, a skeptic of these kind of more authoritarian kind of top-down impulses where Florida, for example, really wants to tell you what can you say in the classroom. I just think that goes bad so quickly. And often it's just not feasible, right? You're not going to have a bureaucrat telling you what books you're allowed to write. Um, it just doesn't work. So what we need to do is foster an environment where more different kinds of books are written. And I think that's going to be in part uh, a policy choice of setting an environment that makes that possible. But then in the end, it has to come in a bottom-up way from the research that people want to do. So I want to ask. Um, about the sort of hiring side of this in particular, both where the formal uh, legal rights are and where uh, the, you know, beyond that, what, uh, what we should be doing. Presumably in hiring, we're discriminating to some degree on speech inherently. We discriminate on the basis of the publication somebody's made, their quality of their writings at least. Uh, I think everybody sort of agrees that that, that part should be there. Um, is there a point where that goes too far? Um, our, you know, diversity statements, I think some people think fall in that category, uh, some people don't. Um, so is there a point where that goes too far and how should we handle that? I can start. So the, the First Amendment requires governments not to engage in viewpoint discrimination. Uh, that means when it comes to hiring, you can't tell someone you must ascribe to these particular ideological views or you may not ascribe to these ideological views. So when it comes to diversity statements where, and again, you know, most schools these days do diversity type initiatives and they can be great. But when it comes to the point where it's encroaching on free expression or academic freedom by saying, if you want to get an interview at the school, you must say that anti-racism looks like this and that you are going to incorporate anti-racism as I describe it here on this you know, paper uh, from the administrator in your class about chemistry or what, you know, that is viewpoint discrimination. Um, you also can't, you know, you can't force woke and you can't stop woke. So let's go back to our, you know, resident bad boy, Florida, um, saying, you know, you can't, you can't teach anti-racism. You can't teach stuff about slavery. You can't teach the 1619 Project. Those are the two extremes of the spectrum, and we're seeing all around the country, you know, flavors of that type of initiative. So while faculty hiring can be, you know, all kinds of hiring is a bit of a black box. There's not 
clean categories in many respects when it comes, like, do you like the person? Do they seem like they'd be neat to work with? Like, do you think they'll get along with the faculty? There's not really easy ways to categorize that, but there are clear signs of when viewpoint discrimination is happening. So when you force someone to either ascribe to or swear off a particular view, that's unlawful when it comes to hiring at, at public universities. So that's the clear line, but then again, you know, it can be a bit of a black box and it's rare that, you know, we at FIRE would love to see into all of those boxes and see exactly what does the rubric look like, all that, is there viewpoint discrimination there? Um, but just not doing the blatant stuff would be a good step at many colleges. Yeah, just on the diversity statements specifically, I, I, I bet you have something to say. I have, <laughs> I have thoughts. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, as Alex said, there's certain stuff that's just, uh, you know, does, at least in a public institution, just violate the law, right? You cannot require people to endorse a certain ideology. Uh, there are things about diversity statements, if they're done in a certain way, that I think can be job relevant, right? So we might think about it, for example, at my campus. Uh, we're a majority minority campus. We have a lot of first generation Canadians. And making the case that you can effectively teach a diverse group of students, I think, can be relevant to your ability to do the job. You might still ask, well, do we really glean that information effectively from what somebody writes in a diversity statement? Maybe not, right? But I think the aim of that, at least, is, um, laudable. Uh, the, the question is whether they actually work as advertised. So certainly they can work well as ideological gating mechanisms. Can they work to effectively detect whether somebody can effectively teach and mentor students of diverse backgrounds? I would say the jury is very much out on that. Uh, so. Uh, we actually have a whole lot of questions from the audience here, so I want to start uh, on those. We we'll probably will not certainly not get to um, all of them, or possibly even most of them. So I really apologize already. Um, you, uh, it seems like uh, many, many of you have asked questions here. Um, but I'll start with uh, with this one. The title of this event made me think that this event would be about bringing viewpoints, uh, bringing in viewpoints from outside academia uh, into academia. Uh, like that of the general public. Is there a connection to be made here? Uh, is the university life in trouble because, whether conservative or liberal, we're an elitist institution? And can universities open their doors to the public and get them more involved in education and life on campus? I'll talk about this a little bit. Um, I'm familiar mostly with the North Carolina case. And in North Carolina, we have a lot of land-grant universities and part of their mission is explicitly service to the public. Um, a lot of that is interpret, interpreted in an agricultural way, um, but it is also interpreted in such a way that there should be that public involvement. There should be public programs where, where, where members of the public are invited, involved, part of the discussion on campus. And I think that, one, that does help improve the public trust so if university, you know, universities, if they want to take a um, kind of a selfish <laughs> look at why we might involve the public, that could be a good reason to do so. Um, but I think that programs that do bring in, you know, speakers who are not academics have a, a very good effect on, on campus. It, it improves the viewpoint diversity on campus, and I think it, it just makes the discussion so much more wide because, as, as we've talked about today, academics are, um, I think, significantly different from the general public on a variety of measures. And so, yes, I think absolutely universities should seek out non-academics to come to campus for, um, for you know, various activities. Can I just add something really quick? Sort of spinning off on that, I'm thinking about what happened at Stanford, God, was it over a year ago, where the you know, Judge uh, yeah. Stuart Kyle Duncan, this is a federal judge, uh, I think it was Trump appointee conservative, has said, had some, um, you know, negative things to say about abortion rights and, and trans rights, wouldn't use someone's pronoun correctly. Um, and when they came to, they did a, a Fed sock, um, event at Stanford and it was basically shouted down and in 
like this, one of the best, I think, defenses of free speech that's been written in, in a decade. Stanford Law Dean Jenny Martinez, a few days later, um, made among the many great points she made was that you know these Stanford law students are not gonna be law students forever. They're gonna graduate and they're gonna go out and maybe they're gonna bring clients before judges like Stuart Duncan who have a set of beliefs and um, politics and power, a lot of power that you know they're gonna have to contend with. So just you know, shouting him down is like not a super, like that's not super useful for these students who really would do better to try and understand what it is that someone like him is thinking and how he makes his, um, you know, how he how he interprets the law. So it's an incredibly useful, um, not just thought experiment, but like that's how we do life, right? Like when we graduate, we're gonna have to go out and contend with a world that's not full of people in our silo that like don't think exactly like us. So schools should be eager to get, you know, radical or even just, what's the word you use? Deviant <laughs> viewpoints, <laughs> I'm gonna use that more, on campus so that students can have the opportunity for growth. Yeah, I'll just really quickly um, add to that. Uh, I think it's interesting to think about this as a more specific case of generally, you know, when do we trust elites and what do we want from them? So if I go to a physician, I, I mean, I want that to be somebody who's highly trained and different from me, right? But I also care that that person effectively solves my problem. If I feel that they're for some ideological reason gonna treat me suboptimally, I'm not gonna be happy about that. And I, I think we're in a similar role here of ultimately we do work for the public, right? And they, they give us a, a, a lot of rope to kind of do our own thing, uh, to specialize, to explore weird ideas, but ultimately it does have to come back to we're providing some useful public service. If they don't think we're doing that, then we're in real trouble. The next one here says uh, that there's talk of, about the legal side of things here. What about non-legal pressures and limiting the boundaries of free speech? Uh, and they cite what happened at, at UPenn and when there's pressures from funders and other constituencies that have perhaps as much power or more than, uh, than others on campus. Yeah, I mean, we've even seen here in Wisconsin legislative, uh, legislative meddling, you know, it's it, legislative uh, initiatives that protect free speech, you will be shocked to know we think are great. Legislative initiatives to, you know, say only one view is allowed on campus, we don't like so much. Um, and there can certainly be like good and bad donor pressure too. Like we saw after October 7th, we've got Liz McGill at the University of Pennsylvania sort of making these very like, you know, pro-Palestinian statements. And then many of her Jewish donors who are giving millions and billions of dollars to Penn are going, we're gonna snap our checkbook closed. And then the next day, here comes a statement where Liz McGill like, you know, is converting to Judaism basically <laughs> and like love Zionists. And so it's like, come on, you know. Uh, get a grip, but so legislative pressure, donor pressure can be good and bad, but we see a lot of, you know, we, we, don't, we don't see a lot of donors and legislators saying we want viewpoint diversity on campus. We see those pressures saying we want more, you know, we want more of our views on campus, which is kind of like on the one hand, like that's the function of a legislator is to serve their constituencies um, or a donor. They want what they want, but we also have to think about the the core purpose of a university, which is not to sort of be not apolitical, but you know, not sway in the political winds and instead hold fast to more scientific type principles that we expect of this particular institution. So again, stuff like institutional neutrality, they're not saying be totally apolitical. What institutional neutrality is saying is let's have the conversation begin from a place where we are recognizing the core purpose of what we're doing here at a university, which is to start with like, you know, knowledge building and truth seeking rather than starting from a political type place or pleasing a particular donor. Um, and certainly we would love to see whoever is in charge of a given college or university be really knowledgeable and strong in those principles. They're gonna have to be in this day and age if they wanna be running a university um, true to those core principles. I mean, it, it's not surprising, right, that universities have to respond to stakeholders and the 
kind of outrage of some of the Penn faculty where these people gave the university, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and now they want to say, oh my God, it's like, what do, you, what do you think? Like, yeah, they're going to feel that they're entitled to a say when they gave you that much money. But I, I think it really helps um, if you have a core set of principles that a priori you say, if you give us money, here's kind of what you're buying into. Here's the deal, right? We maintain a certain like you said, I think this is a great way to put it, not swing with the political winds. We don't issue statements about everything and anything. What we do is a certain kind of circumscribed set of things, that that's what you would be funding. And I think it's a lot easier to make that case if that's what you've been doing consistently. You know, on the uh, idea about informal pressures. So here's a case study of this. Uh, I have a friend, Mark, Mark Ranieris. Uh, he teaches at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, some of you may have heard that name. He did a study where he showed evidence that uh, kids raised in same-sex parent households have more negative outcomes. So, and it was peer review, excellent study, he's an excellent scholar. Well, his study got uh, investigated, it got audited, uh, there was all sorts, you know, he's at University of Texas at Austin now, he's sort of a pariah on campus. Uh, and he's done a lot of other research, but that's the research he's known for, uh, that he did this study, which uh, basically was the first uh, study that, that used a probability sample. Everything else was these small, convenient samples, and, and really, you can only get so much out of that. Uh, that's, that's informal pressure, because it really is signaling to people, if you do the wrong type of study, then you're going to sort of be excommunicated from the scientific community. And right now, he's hardly published any peer-reviewed articles. He has to write books now because he won't be able to get his work through the peer review process uh, because of, of that. So that's sort of a way in which people signal what you're allowed to and not allowed to do research on. So this uh, question asks uh, whether there's a freedom to ignore in the First Amendment and how that figures into Yes, ignore people, for God's sake. Ignore, like instead of shouting them down or censoring them, yes. So the First Amendment, um, you know, gives you the right to speak and also the right not to speak. Um, so absolutely, you have, you know, you, we don't, I guess, what's that bumper sticker? Like, democracy is not a spectator sport. But I think it kind of can, I mean, it shouldn't be. But like, you don't have to go to a, hear a speaker that you dislike. Or I think probably more apt here, like I'm trying to think of like what was, what prompted this question like you know uh, what we hear from a lot of students who disagree with many of of fire stances are like well i i don't know let's take anti-semitism i'm a jewish student why should i have to be on a campus where people are ch chanting from the river to the sea or intifada like i don't feel safe and i, I can't ignore it it's like uh, that's one of the stickier questions that we we talk through a lot because i don't know that the the law, I mean, so the law will set the bar for like, what's discriminatory harassment? You know, if you're in someone's face and saying like, you know, go home Jew, uh, that can hit that bar for discriminatory harassment. But what if you're a Jew and you have to, you know, walk across a campus where everybody is protest, you know, everybody is anti-Zionist. Um, in the aggregate, can that ever reach the bar? And I don't know that we have law on that, I think to a certain extent, students definitely need to expect when they're on a campus, they're gonna hear viewpoints that they disagree with and they can choose to engage with those views or ignore them. But definitely that question about like, when you're on a campus and you feel like views are all a certain way or another, are you able to ignore them in a way that still allows you to get your education? And that is one of the, the stickier questions that has come up of late, especially with the anti-Semitism stuff. I think something that we've been seeing probably for you know, about 20 years so is the redefinition of harm. And I think that that is what is conflating these issues on campus. I know that when I was in school, I would, I would not have said I was harmed by ideas that I didn't like. Um, you know, I grew up, it was, you know, sticks and stones can break by bones and words never hurt me. That is, I, I think that is probably older generations view of what words are, it's like, no, they, they are not harm. But the, the latest 
rhetoric around speech that people don't like is that it is harmful. And I think that those of us who defend free speech need to take time to really talk about what harms are and take that argument seriously and you know unpack it, figure out where it's coming from and and combat it because if the people think it's a trump card, well you're hurting me so you have to stop. Well also acknowledging that you know, I mean the it's so in, in that Snyder versus Phelps case that I referenced, the Westboro Baptist Church case, where they say this, you know, super, you know, what most of us would think is disgusting speech is protected, they say it's because speech is powerful. Speech can stir people to action. It can make people cry and laugh and, you know, it can cause, it can cause pain. That is what the Supreme Court has said, but we have to establish the line between like, you know, well, what is, worthy then of government suppression. There's still not, a, even though speech can be powerful and even though speech can cause pain and upset, what power do we want to hand over to the government to decide which of the speech they're going to rubber stamp or not? And I definitely agree with you that there it has been, you know, the zeitgeist on many campuses is like, well, if I am subjectively upset by this speech, it should not be, it is causing me harm and therefore it should not be on campus or not allowed. And that's not gonna work either. So definitely, a, you know, room for nuance there. Yeah, I kinda like to throw an idea out, out here. So I think in a social media world, we sort of condition ourselves that we have to engage in everything. Now, someone says something we don't like, you know, we, we, we Twitter or, or Facebook or whatever, we, we just sit on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I admit I've done that in the past. My wife said, why are you doing this? And I've realized how stupid it is because you're not, you're not changing anyone's minds. So I wonder if we should teach people, you know what? You don't have to engage in everything, you know, that you should pick your battles. Uh, and, and I wonder if, if, if as part of critical thinking, we teach people maybe there are certain topics you don't want to engage in. Maybe you don't know well, them well enough. Maybe you know it's not productive. Uh, the, yeah, there, there's no need to engage in everything. And, and you can teach that without saying you can't engage. But I think this eagerness to engage and, and, this, and, and these people are wrong. You have, I have to jump in there. I think that that's, not, I, know it's not help, I know it's not helpful for our mental health. And it's not helpful for our polarization. So maybe that's something we should, you know, talking about a holistic solution, maybe part of thinking about critical thinking is, is how to uh, teach people when to engage and how to engage in a way that's productive. So I realize we're way over time. I want to, we have uh, way too many questions left, but I want to squeeze one or two more uh, very uh, quick ones uh, in um, as we wrap up. Uh, so is, uh, this one asks, or says that uh, public university administration, people with, uh, with status are instructing the workforce to view DEI as you know, some, as X, uh, that is alarming, but also happening. Uh, and how do you recommend, uh, as a, a useful uh, retort or response, given that you don't know whether that that person uh, is following official guidance or sort of going off on their own uh, views? Okay, I have to jump in on this one because I've been uh, studying ways in which to deal with uh, diversity. And I think you know, I think the evidence is pretty clear that the way we traditionally do, traditionally do DEI does not work. And there's a lot of evidence why it doesn't work. Uh, one thing that I've been working on and trying to develop is a more of a collaborative conversation approach where we learn how to learn about other individuals, how to find solutions that build on each other rather than tear each other down. Uh, I, think, I think that rather than trying to tear apart DEI, we should try to make it, more, make it do what it's supposed to do. Uh, recognize that's not going in a direction where, it's gonna, where we're actually going to do a lot more damage than good but there could be solutions and, and solution that I would propose if someone says, well, what are you gonna do about DEI? Is okay, why don't we look at, can we, can we build on what we know about how to have a cloud of conversations and to create an atmosphere where people are curious about others, people's ideas, and learn how, to, how, how, can, I, how can I develop an idea to where it meets their needs as well as my needs so that we all work on it together rather than this, you know, I'm gonna force my ideas on you and you have to go along, which means you're gonna sabotage my ideas. So that's a direction that I would like to see us go with DEI. Stop thinking about getting rid of it. Stop thinking about doing what's not worked. 
but try to go in some different directions. And, and, and uh, that's the one, one direction I propose. Yeah, so, just to, oh. sorry, w one quick thought on that. I, I think that's totally right. And I think when you get to kind of concrete solutions, there's a lot of room for agreement, right? So if, if the problem is, for example, that uh, we are missing talent because some people do their background, don't think that they fit in academia. I think that's a problem that lots of people can recognize and then we can come up with solutions for how to maybe reach out to those folks, how to address some of the obstacles that they're facing. And I think that goes over a lot better than, well, I'd like you to pledge allegiance to this you know, set of principles. And incidentally, it also has real benefits that I think the pledging allegiance to principles doesn't really, right? You're actually uh, reaching out to people and including them when perhaps they had not been included. So I'll end with this last one. It asks uh, about, uh, it says uh, university bias, maybe it's better overt rather than covert. I think perhaps partly challenging the uh, idea of institutional neutrality, that maybe it's better that we're uh, to be open that the university, uh, you know, campus overwhelmingly thinks this, if that's the case. So I should specify that I, I would not expect a religious institution to accept to adopt institutional neutrality. I think it would be totally inappropriate for that kind of institution to do that. Um, and likewise, and this is something that Jonathan Haidt has said many times, like if a private university wants to change its mission, mission statement to social justice and go all in and say this is more important than free speech, we don't guarantee you free speech and this is what we're doing, then sure, don't be neutral. But universities that promise their students free speech and promise that environment and say that their mission is the search for truth. Um, they should do everything they can to make the environment conducive to the search for truth and conducive to free speech on campus and open inquiry. So um, I think that will wrap things up. So thank you all uh, very much for being here. Uh, let's give a round of our applause to our speakers. As, as well as, because I know we're way over on time, all of you who stood around till the end, as well as our live streaming audience at this uh, recording of this event will also be available on our website if you're interested in watching it again or sharing it with anybody. Uh, so thank you all and enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>